Chat de Kinga, Great British Landscapes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> a question about what, how you started and who were you looking at as a photographer when you started off? I mean, I know it wasn't just landscape photography. No, no, actually it wasn't at all. Um, probably the earliest influence was Yusuf Karsh. And uh, when I was in high school, um, I, I actually did a paper, and I, I say this because I had a 50th class reunion, but I had a class in psychology and I did uh, a, a paper called The Psychological Portrait. And, uh, and I used Karsh's work and uh, you know, some of his interaction with Churchill where he pulled out yeah. the cigar and, and things like that. Right. But, but um, uh, I, I, you know, his work was such at a high quality. And I think that's the, uh, probably the, the, the first memory of really ultra high quality photography was Karsh's work. Yeah. And, and, and Ansel came much later for me. Is that focusing everything onto one moment? If yeah, but, but, but it, was, it was, you know, it was large format. And it, was the, it was the landscape of the human face. Yeah. So it was, it was incredibly powerful. And, uh, and nobody did it better at the time. Hmm. When, when did landscape and photography become an interest? Like, <clears> when we were exposed to um, Well, you know, it's it. landscape photography uh, didn't really um, settle in until the 80s. 1981 or so, but um, prior to that, I mean, I was always interested in the landscape as far as hiking, and I hung out in, I was fortunate back in Illinois to live in an area which was open prairie. So land, I was more enthralled by the landscape and the prairie landscape in, in, in the Midwest, and you know, garden spiders and snakes and the usual stuff that kids hang out with. So you and, lived there, that's why you were growing. Yeah, I lived there, and then, and then I went to work for the newspapers, uh, and you know, it, in my 20s. I was actually a staff photographer for a major in a metropolitan paper when I was 20. And so, so then I went right into photojournalism. Yeah. And it was, a, it was a time when uh, photography was very much alive. And in fact, the, 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 photo, the expression photojournalism was just being coined. And uh, so I, I was associated with people from uh, all over the country were drawn to the Midwest, and of course there was civil rights going on, so it was just a, an exciting time for a photojournalist. And then after that, I, you want me to go through the whole, yeah, well, the whole mishmash? Because basically I progressed um, into photojournalism as basically an ignorant kid. And I mean, I had, I, th I believe you're, you're given certain basic uh, talent in terms of visual acumen. I mean, you can actually kind of figure out if you're left-handed and dyslexic as I was, that yeah. I was going to have a bent in that direction. So, and so for me, it comes very naturally. So I ended up being a photojournalist. I got extremely lucky. Uh, you know, I won lots of awards. And at a very young age, I was brash. Still am, apparently. Uh, <laughs> and and um, and yet now with age, I can look back and, and see what, you know, what, a, what a poppy, what a, what a peacock I was, you know. But, but now I, um, anyway, I went on, I made it into the editing end of it. Yeah. And it's sort of like the Peter Principle, you reach a certain point and they give you a job that you can't do. Yeah. So I became the photo editor and the assignment editor. And then I moved to Arizona. I'm going a quick version of the life here. I won the Pulitzer in 71 in Chicago. Uh, and then I moved to Tucson in 76 and uh, became the director of graphics for, a, for a, a smaller newspaper, which was good because it gave me the whole, um, the whole experience. Whereas in Chicago, you just did one cer yeah. certain aspect. This one, I would actually, I, I could see the presses run, you know, take it from press to, to finished product. And that was good. Um, and then I quit to become a wilderness guide. Uh, and uh, there's, there's all kinds of uh, interludes along the way, and that's what I'm going to talk about. But uh, um, I became a, and, and, and so the wilderness guide aspect uh, sort of got me back to that childhood connection with the landscape. And that's why I'm kind of I'm circuitously answering your question. Yeah. But so I've always had a, an affinity for uh, the landscape and also the relationship of space and the monumental aspect of, of, of landscape. And of course, Arizona with the, with the huge horizons and, and the sweeping uh, light is, uh, is Mecca. And you mentioned you were graphic editor. 
Well, well I was over the art department and the photographic department. Right. So, so it'd be like an assistant managing editor graphics. So, you, you so I messed with typefaces, and I, you know, I, so I got a really broad, um, you know, education basically on the job, and and I learned to be a real severe editor of my own work as well as other people's. Yeah. That was interesting because there's, there's quite a few British photographers we speak to who end up having some form of background in graphic design. Mm -hmm. in there. And I think, I think composition and graphic design are there's, yeah. incredibly close to each other. Right, point. exactly. And as much as you can have that uh, become second nature, um, and, and you know, like in, 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 here in, at the U, in the UK, and especially in the BBC contest, many, many of the photographers have a biology background. And I, you know, I can see who has you know, an art background who has a biology background. Mm. And uh, it, it is, it's fascinating. And as much as you can merge the two, you know, that, then, then the, you know, as, 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 as many ways as you can approach the viewer with something interesting, yeah. you know, I say juxtaposing, but you can juxtapose colors, textures, uh, you know, life, death, and as many of these little, little things to perk people's interest, you know, the more interesting the photograph. And that moved into your, your photography. Right. When, I mean, the photography came after you started doing the wilderness. Uh, was, that, was that alongside it? Was well, that, no, no. I mean, when I first left the paper, I was doing. I was basically guiding, and and, and I, you know, I, I, I shortchanged you on, on the history because when I it was in Chicago, and I think it was 1974. I was working for the Chicago Tribune, and I again was in management at that point. I was assistant photo editor, and you know, that's a staff of 50 photographers, so it was, it was big, and I was also shooting for, uh, for the Sunday Magazine. So when I'm shooting for the Sunday Magazine, I did a story on a guy climbing Mount Rainier, which is a technical crevasse climb. And uh, the upshot was, and it was in April, it was not a summer climb. So um, we got hit by a very severe storm, a whiteout, 70 mile an hour winds. Uh, he ultimately did not make the climb and I did. So, so it sort of changed my life. Um, it's, it's sort of like this, uh, you know, vortex going on, you know, and, and I, I, you know, I can remember distinctly front pointing up an ice face, uh, you know, ice shards flying, I've got crampons on, the fog, uh, the cloud line is below me, and the sun is rising, and I felt like my heart was going to burst out of my chest, it was, a, it was the highest high, mm. and uh, so, so this combination of uh, potential visuals, wild places, uh, it was just like everything was sort of in sync. Yeah. So there was no doubt from that point on, you know, that, that I was going to pursue, pursue photography in wild places. Yeah. And then, then later I started reading about Philip Hyde and, uh, and the writer Edward Abbey and, and reading about endangered places. Uh, then it sort of clicked in my head, you know, because again, when you're young, you don't know anything, but it sort of clicked that you really could use this medium to make a difference. And then it ceased being play. I mean, it's always going to be play, but, but it, there was a mission. And the, those early photographers, were they, were they been, as you mentioned, Philip Hyde? Was that, was that the first exposition? I mean, Ansel Adams had been in there in the background. Well, it, when I was in Chicago, I read an article, actually written by Gary Brash, who's a contemporary, um, about Philip Hyde's work with the Sierra Club in, in preserving and creating national parks. Yeah. So, I mean, this was photography that uh, was clearly used in behalf of wild places. And so he, he, his was a life that I just thought, God, you know, I was in Chicago and I was already... You know, not famous, but I was, I had arrived a little yes. bit, and I thought, you know, I'm wasting my life here. You know, this guy is really doing it, and he's out west. So, you know, I set about moving west, you know, like I said, becoming a wilderness guide, but later on, I actually met Phil, and then we traveled together, and I also met Edward Abbey, and, you know, traveled with him. So it's, uh, it's interesting when you look back at a life, at your own life. Uh, a, uh, it's photography is, is memories, you know, whether you, you know it at the time or not, but I, you can look back and sort of see where I was, what I was doing, and then you think about the people that sort of, you, you're on a life course and they bumped into you and they knocked you in a different direction ever so slightly, or maybe radically. And, and together, uh, all these people uh, really controlled um, 
you know, sort of what I am today. They sort of define, and I think that's true for everybody. And unless you go through, unless you're uh, sleepwalking through life. Uh, mm. Mm. Mr. George Bush. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fascinating. I, I, you know, just, um, well, I would echo that very much. You know, how <clears throat> extraordinarily you see when you look back on your life and the people who made a difference to what you do and what you feel and think. Uh, I mean, it's fascinating, uh, certainly for me, to hear you talk of Edward Abbey, uh, you know, who, I mean, I read Desert Solitaire at least 15 years ago. And, um, you know, it was an instant, wow, this guy's amazing, you know, how, right. you know, to have had those experiences and those thoughts and those insights and, and to be so angry and motivated about them. Uh, and, and it's funny how uh, people have to really care passionately about things to make a difference. As I was saying, I think it's... Uh, um, I forget the English writer who um, who said it, but that you know that the uh, that the reasonable man bends to the ways of the world, but the unreasonable man changes the world to their ways. You know, and it's only actually in the end, you know, having having right. uh, having anger, you know, and and channeling Fire it into saying, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. to make change. And and this is uh, you know, because I'm a sort of rather moderate m m mannered person, I just feel that's what I really miss. You know, it's having that ability to, because I want to see things get better, you know. No, and it's it's really inspiring to hear your yeah. backstory, Jack. The pro the problem is you get you know is it, you know when you're younger, it tends you know any art form uh, tends to be about you, and therefore it's immature. Yeah. And and uh, as you get older, you. Uh, <laughs> You realize sometimes that you, you know, as as a young person, you have squandered opportunities, and you know one of the things I was going to talk about is integrity. You know, if once you go down the road of being dishonest, you know, you spend the rest of your life fighting to get recognized as being honest again, and uh, it's, uh, and, you know, with with uh, digital photography, there's such amazing things you can do, yes. and to resist that is just uh, it's sometimes really difficult. It, it is. A a big dichotomy with photography, in landscape photography, is to say, one on, on the one hand, it's an art, therefore anything goes. Right, right, exactly. And on, the, on the other hand, it's a, it's a documentary art, in which case the, right. the believability. Yeah, you just have to decide what house you want to live in mm. and how long you want to live there, right, maybe, but... It's difficult to sit on the border between the two. Well, I, I think it's impossible. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, it's... The geographic is is very stodgy in their approach, but yet you you feel that that you need to be unbending in, in certain areas, and you know they've had their hand burnt by 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 their contributors, so now they exercise you know pretty phenomenal control, and uh, yeah you know I, it, I I vacillate I'll be honest with you I mean there's little tiny things that you could do to a photograph that like you've got a corner that's a little bit dark or something like that is that if i just content aware of that and yeah. make it even toned is that dishonest or is that any different than burning and dodging in the dark yeah. so i you know it, you know i've got my own code of ethics i mean i just it's like a doctor do no harm you know yeah. and, and beyond that uh but it is wide open and it's relatively seamless the, the uh, but I said there are there are no rules i mean someone yeah. like the national geographic had to make their own rules up right and then implement them and it's neither right nor wrong. It's just what, what they It are. is, yeah. It's their standards, but uh, but you know, but photography is, is an interesting thing because, as you say, it's 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 art on one hand, a documentary, but it's also engineering and art. You know, so you could be, and I see photographers that make these technically just you know perfect pictures that are absolutely void of soul, and uh, and. Uh, you know, I think that's a very interesting point because I, I think that is one of the temptations that comes with, with Photoshop. I mean, Photoshop's a fantastic tool, but the way that it's used is entirely down to different folks having different ideas about how it works. And, um, but, but, but I think if you're a nature photographer, part of what makes nature believable is the rough edges and the, uh, and the imperfections. Right. You know, and the moment you start cloning all of those out, or smoothing them over, then the moment that's the moment you take the truth out of it and the and the kind of uh, the believability out of it. And that is a, a, a fine line. Um, uh, the, there's no doubt, you know, the, the eye and the brain together 
are you know the most powerful processing machine we've ever right. we will ever come across. So when we use a photograph, which is a, is such a, a, a simple form, uh, an honest to goodness light recording machine, as I like to think of it, you know there, there will be imperfections. It's not what you saw. The brain has already done so much processing, processing, but it, it isn't. Uh, uh, it, it's the judgment of the photographer in the end to how far they're prepared to go uh, to, to change it. It's, it's interesting when you get photographers who try to stage things. I mean, the classic one is leaves in a, on the next river. And yeah, always, it's, always can tell. You it's, know. It's, mm. it's fairly obvious immediately. You right. cannot create chaos with it. Right, right. Mm. So it's, uh, it's, it's no, I mean, there's... Uh, gosh, I mean I, I mean, I can spot it always, you know, and then... It, it, it was, what's sort of fascinating now is well, <laughs> we're going to get into HDR a little bit, but uh, you know I, I, I'm not a proponent of HDR, and, and, uh, and I sort of laugh at it because you know the masking and everything else is so good in Photoshop that why would you want to do HDR? Because you can do it seamlessly elsewhere. Mm. But having said that, this friend of mine called me up and he said, "Have you ever had an advertising agency ask for that HDR look?" <laughs> and I said, well, that's wrong because you're supposed to do that so that it doesn't look, look. There is no look. Yeah. So, yeah. But, but now that, now that you know, they've apparently isolated a certain, whether it's the grunge look or whatever, it's now mm. become a style. Yeah, it that has. That was supposed to have been something that was there to make it look more natural. <laughs> <laughs> so, One of the gentlemen that did the uh, Katrina disaster coverage all in HDR, quite a few shows, uh, and it was, it was that classic. Well, you know, I, I, again, that's one of my big objections is, uh, and to me, this is going back to youth, you know, and sophomoric approach to photography, is that uh, when, the photo, when the photography becomes more about you than the place, to me, that's a huge problem. Yeah. Because, you know, I mean, it's sort of like I said, do no harm, but it's also tell the truth and honor the place. And uh, I think when you, when you do it in such a gimmicky way that it's about the photographer, uh, I sort of question it. It's about the process. It becomes about the process. Exactly. I'm not, I do think if there is a dividing line, that is a dividing line. You know, is it about the subject matter? Is it about the process? And and you know, I think you can you can still process pictures and keep them about the subject matter. Yeah. Yeah. But as soon as you step over that line, then you've lost me anyway. And, and if you keep it above documenting the place, there's still ways to do it and just look for the intricate design or deal with the negative space in the mm. composition yeah. and make a, a completely impressionistic photograph mm. but you haven't really made it about you it's just, well I mean it is about you because it's your vision it's always going to be your vision but uh, but I you know the process I think is probably a better or you say process I'm sorry. <laughs> you say brown <laughs> you say tomato we say tomato. Like color with an <laughs> O-R or O-U-R um, yeah. I'm just writing an article on uh, Gustave Le Gray mm -hmm. I don't know if French photography maybe 1840s, I suppose, he started mm -hmm. working. And he famously did the seascapes, everybody taking pictures with blank skies because he had no blue uh, behavior on the film and he didn't have the dynamic range. So he was compositing the skies mm -hmm. and water. And he was incredibly famous. But he was, he was creating the first HDRs, I think, right at the time, yeah. all blends. Um, well, I mean, there, there's really expedition photographs from some of the British explorers where they would use pencils on the negative, Sketch too. Me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, it's... Uh, but he was um, also bemoaning the commoditization of photography as well. Right. In 1840? In 1840. Well, it was, uh, he, was, he was doing uh, high-end, large format portraiture. Mm -hmm. um, he, did, he did his own work as well. But the carte de visite came out for four pictures on a single mm -hmm. four or five. Mm -hmm. And it just undercut the whole portrait market in, overnight. And he lost his business and had to leave France in disgrace. <laughs> uh, Something's never changed, right? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and, it, and that, that, it's just interesting because it parallels still. And also, interestingly, he made all his money, <coughs> a lot of his money, out of giving workshops to other photographers. Really? Yeah. Uh, teaching them how to do daguerreotypes. WWW. <laughs> yeah. Gustave Le Grey. So, uh, he's. Mm. It sort of parallels what's happening now is cycles in photography, the stock photography. And the rights managed uh, section of it sort of died out. Stock photo photography has gone mm. the way down. Do you see anything left in stock photography, either in niche or high end, or, or is it just this, this thing that's. No, I mean, I think, I think high end and niche is, is, is valid. 
Um, there are certain people that have collections that are, that are truly unique. Um, on the other hand, you've got, uh, you know, a, a, a billion people out there in a billion locations, and eventually one of them is going to see something that's truly unique. And, and that's, uh, it may not be the best of quality. I mean, there's so many examples of this that, that uh, you know, from the iPhone uh, of the, uh, of the uh, young woman killed in uh, the Mideast, um, I mean, how can, you, how can you possibly match that kind of power? And it's, it's, sort of the old, it's sort of like an extension of the old newspaper adage of F11 and be there. Mm. You know, but, but what you can do and what uh, I think is not necessarily a challenge, but I mean, it's, it's really the only way you're going to succeed is to, is to perfect your own vision. And, and as much as possible, uh, maintain the highest level of quality and, uh, and keep your integrity. And those three things, I think, are going to, I mean, I personally am going to, I find myself migrating more into, and again, teaching workshops. But um, I think more and more photographers are having to do production, stuff that was done by somebody else. And then, then we get to do all this extra work, and then we charge a quarter as much. So, I mean, so, so as a business model, it's horrible. And you don't get the phone calls back. You know, it's really reassuring to hear other people describing this from the other side of the pond. No, no, but I mean, I mean, that's mm. universal. But, mm. uh, yeah, it is. It's the democratization of the uh, of the business, and uh, it, it used to be actually a real craft to produce just a technically good photograph. Mm. And and, uh, and now, I mean, I've, I have people in my workshops that just tell me that they they don't have a diaphragm on their camera. <laughs> <laughs> and they're and they're and they're making these uh, yeah. these great exposures, but uh, they don't have a clue about what they're doing. That's right. Or why they're doing it. And in some ways, it's very liberating, and it's, it's great. In some ways, it's horrible. So it's. Uh, yeah. mm. I'm just going to ask a question. I'm just going to try and find the uh, questions from our. That's good. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I was kind of tempted to, in a very boring way, to ask Jack about the, the transition from 35 mil to 5x4 and now perhaps, you know, using digital, you know, as a, as a kind of a, a step, a step on from 5x4 from because you shot with 5x4 for 20 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, I, and I still miss it. Mm. Mm. I mean, to me, it's, it's zen like. You, you know yeah. that. I mean, you're looking with the focusing cloth over your head, but. Uh, yeah. um, Actually, I was sort of surprised that, uh, you know, using the Nikon D3X and, and stitching images to make these massive files, um, you know, I mean, I've made some panoramas that are a gigabyte and a half, and, yeah. uh, and, and they're, they're tremendous, uh, and they, uh, of course the optics are great. But um, anyway, I, I was sort of relieved to know that I didn't have to go under the focusing cloth to create a good composition. <laughs> And I mean, I've learned things like using live view and, and to just double check my corners because uh, yeah. sometimes you, you tend to, be, to shoot a little bit more loosely with small cameras and, and, and you try to go too fast, which is the first thing I teach in workshops is to slow down mm. and, and to sort of get in touch with the place. And so that much is nothing, you know, that part hasn't changed. Sure. And also yeah. establishing a relationship and context by being there first yeah. without a camera. Yeah. And all these things uh, are, you know, they just translate perfectly, seamlessly. Yeah. But when you started shooting with the digital SLRs, yeah. did you find it difficult to, did the enthusiasm start making you take pictures too quickly? Um, did you find it difficult to get that process no. back in again, or was it just? No, actually, the, 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 some of the first pictures I took were under starlight of night blooming flowers on a sand dune. And I just was like, "Holy cow! I can actually shoot at this mm, mm, incredible at this high mm. ISO." And it was it was it was mind blowing. And uh, you know, I uh, as I said, it's for me. It's very intuitive how I compose. And and, and but the, the hard part for me is to envision five vertical frames translating into one horizontal. Yeah, same same. And yeah, yeah. So I. Um, so it's sort of you, you, you but but shooting a four by five, or we say five, four by five, um, five by four. <laughs> <laughs> tomatoes, tomatoes. <laughs> but but you 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 have to sort of pre-visualize anyway. 
uh, me, you know, the, the rule of thumb is if you see the great light, you're already late for work. So in as much as possible, I can you know, pretty much pre-visualize uh, how these five images are going to come together as, in a finished product. Uh, and, and now, I mean, having done it a while, it's, it's, just, it's second nature. I, I, start, I often wonder if I pick up the 4x5, you know, which I'm, I've saved one camera, three lenses, and 600 sheets of Velvet frozen. And uh, at one point, or at some point, I intend to go do a fine art project. You know, I say the 240 Fujinon, you know, my, yeah. my, one of the sharpest lenses ever made, and a couple of Super Simars, but, um, but I intend to, 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 you know, actually use that, you know, if, if the processing is still around, or the processing. What will you see is, what do you think the 5-fold will bring that wasn't there in the, the digital? I'm not, I'm, I mean, we, we no, the conversation it, it, that goes that, 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 that Okay, that no, I so mean, it, it's, for me, it's, it's, it's a matter of the camera movements. With with uh, with the view camera, it's unlimited, and and with uh, even even with PC lenses, you can do a shift and you can do a tilt. But I could do any combination of tilt swings, shifts, yeah. to you know, and they're not limited by eight degrees or five degrees. The coverage of the future you've got. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, I can s stretch the uh, the movements to to incorporate total sharpness on a very broad, uh, expansive scene. So, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, there are certain things that, as far as I, you know, I don't think you can ever do some of the stuff. And, uh, I mean, there's a difference between critical sharpness and hyperfocal sharpness. And that's, you know, you can accomplish a lot by going to F16, but it's still not the same as F45 with all the right uh, movements. Yeah. In, in, terms of, <clears throat> in terms of the medium itself, do you, I mean, they're obviously different, digital is different. Films different. You mean you, you've used Velvet 50? Sure. You've used Velvet 50 for. Yeah, uh, and I've used and, I've, and I, lately I, when I started scanning more, I went to Provia. Yeah. And uh, you know, it's a, you can pretty much uh, change them sort of interchangeably. They, they, the colors got a little stranger as of late. Yeah. And I think when it, when a, a medium is sort of being dialed out of the system. I think the quality control maybe got yeah. less stringent. Mm -hmm. And you know, some like film processing, chemistry likes film. Yeah. As you as you use less and less, it becomes more erratic. Yeah. So you're sending out to labs they may. Well and, and the other thing is like if you go to a lab, it used to be the best guy was on your film. Yeah. And now the best guy is in the digital side and you get the guy who's, you know, yes. yeah, the pretty marginal. You may put the clip yeah. into your image area, you yeah. know. And yeah, exactly. So that's a problem too. And they're not processing 24 hours a day, 20, you know, 24 exactly. 7, 365, yeah. which they always used to, literally, yeah. certainly right. in London. So, you know, and, and with constant replenishment and, and all of that, which, you know, it's a healthy line in E6 terms. So. But, but the, yeah. the funny thing is when you, uh, when you learn photography with film and a one degree spot meter and limited uh, mm. uh, exposure latitude, and people will ask me about digital. I say, it's so incredibly easy. It's I feel like I feel like I'm dirty, you know, like <laughs> <laughs> contaminated. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's yeah. just like they, like I have had uh, every, every workshop will say, well, I'm I'm really struggling with exposures, and I look at them, you know, like just push the histogram to the right and shoot it. <laughs> it's like it's never been easier. And uh, um, there's a few readers using the um, you know, Kodak release, I mean, portrait the film. Uh huh. So, Color negative. Uh, color negative film. <coughs> mm. ah. the, same, the same is as used for <coughs> cinematographer. Right. Um, which has supposedly around 17 or 18 dy stops of dynamic range. Really? Wow. Um, mm. I've had people doing five stops either way on a composition, and they're all coming out. Yeah. Um, which, 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 which is still there for photography, it's still there for Sure, cinema. sure. But Velvia was always a special case in terms of. There was a very small sweet spot with it's that. It had its own look, and it had yeah. a small sweet spot, and that low contrast, the fact you had to work in right. low contrast, I think, helped the photographs. The photographs mm. in, in, in overcast light just sparkled. Mm. And, and, the, and the, you know, the, for me, the, the problem was when you had contrasting light, you just about never used it. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, uh, or you had to get that absolute first kiss of light in the morning and the last one at mm. night, and that sort of 
Yeah, so in some ways it was limiting. And, and, and if you, you, know, you saw some of the images I'm showing, I'm converting some to black and white and working with silver effects, Nick software, which is really terrific. Um, it's, uh, it's just, uh, you sort of, I feel like I'm going full circle because I started with black and white and I'm sort of finishing there. Mm -hmm. So, in terms of the project, have you got any ideas for what you might be doing as a, as a personal project? I mean, the, most of the photography you're doing now, is that commercial or personal or drawing workshops? Or? Well, you know, the, um, this ILCP, International League of Conservation Photographers, has been eating up a lot of my time with um, a chance to sort of give back. And uh, so, you know, the, the whole concept of throwing photographic talent towards environmental issues uh, is terribly important. And, uh, you know, uh, again, I worked with Daniel Beltra on several of these, but, and, 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 and Tom Peschik. Um, that ability uh, is, is something that I think is a responsibility. I mean, that, that whole project where you have to... Um, basically work pro bono and, and, and work in behalf of, of causes to, to make a difference. So sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. And, uh, but every time I think you sort of uh, convey your love of the natural world and, and that, that can't help or can't hurt, it can't do anything but help. Uh, but it's... Uh, it's discouraging when you lose these because you're up against oftentimes huge corporations. Uh, this this Trans Canada pipeline right now is a big issue, and the, the dam project in, in Chile and Patagonia is, is another one. So, lots of money. Huge, you, huge vested interests in building. Yeah. Hmm. How do you feel about the fact that using beauty to try and raise awareness? Of well, you, you know, I learned this actually from a, I, I did several books with Harry Abrams in New York. And uh, I worked with writers that were sort of disciples of Edward Abbey. I mean, Chuck, Charles Bowden, Chuck Bowden, um, is a tr fantastic writer. And so he could uh, weave and intercut um, text blocks that were really searing. And so you can draw them in with the beauty of a place, and then he can go in and, and, and amplify that this could be lost, and this is what's likely to happen. And uh, I mean, we did one book called Stone Canyons, which uh, he talked about creating a secret national park that nobody could come to. And uh, it went to Bill Clinton, and he made it into a national monument. So that was like our, Fantastic. that was our biggest, uh, well, I mean, we also did one, uh, you know, a couple of parks in Mexico that became biosphere reserves. So, so when your images have a, you know, a direct impact, and, and you, can, you can never say that it was you that did it because you're just adding another straw on some camel's back and eventually, you know, you, you can win some. But, some, you know, there's, for every one you win, there's ten you lose. But you can't stop trying. Yeah. Well, it's great to feel you, that you can make a difference and also to be part of a collective movement in that direction. Well, yeah. I'm going to talk about that as well because, mm. to me, uh, the ILCP... Um, well, actually, coming over here and meeting with you guys when I was judging the contest, knowing there's a community out there, but I mean, you know, Chileans, Mexicans, Germans, uh, crazy Spaniards like Daniel, uh, there's just this great. Uh, it's, it's it's a wonderful feeling to you know to know that, it, it, you know, you, you sort of have this narrow view as you're younger, but boy, to realize you're part of this community is amazing. Yeah, not divided by national boundaries in it's any way, shape, all, or form. Yeah. No, it is. It's actually really exciting to be involved in, you know, in, in that community. And, well, and you know, if you if you think yeah. about, it, you know, the, mm. think of photography. I mean, I always tell this in my lectures, mm. uh, at workshops. But, but photography is a language, and and we're very lucky that we're conversant in it and uh, and hopefully skilled at it. But it is it 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 just transcends any any border crossings and, and cultures. If you can impact people right where they live, you know, in their heart or their gut, you know, you, you've you've moved them very quickly and very mm. succinctly. Mm. And I think that was the, the the best thing that happened to me as this young man in Chicago is to is to do this Pulitzer project that actually had cause and effect. And so I was able to learn at a young young age that uh, photography really could make a difference. Could make a huge difference. Mm. Yeah, that's fantastic. We have a question. 
guy over ten. Well, I've got a question from a couple of people on the same sort of topic. Is uh, have you taken many pictures in Britain? No. <laughs> that was quick. Second part of that was why not? <laughs> Poor. <laughs> I'm a photographer. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean I've taken uh, Scotland, uh, Sky, and uh, you know when I was much younger, uh, uh, the Ring of Kerry in uh, in Ireland. Uh, um, I guess the urban landscape, and, and I, you know, I tend to think of the no, you know, like it or not. I think of it as a tended garden. Yes. And and I live in an area that's pretty wild, and uh, and part of the success of, for me, and I can't speak for other people, but, but the, what makes images uh, really sing for me, is that deeper connection that's sort of spawned in solitude. And I, you know, I sometimes go to a place and just think for a while. And if it, if it really, uh, if, if I want to wake the muse up, that's how I do it. You know, you know, if my heart sings, then I'm, I'm good to go. You find that difficult when you're out with workshops? And you're going to I do, I do. Big place of it. Yeah, I always tell world. people not to expect uh, to take great photographs, but learn how to take pictures. And, and, but sometimes you get lucky. I mean, we, this last one was amazing. What was that? We were we were up in like in the bristlecone oh, pines yes. and the white mountains and uh, it was not on our schedule. It was it was ostensibly a uh, an autumn workshop to shoot color of aspen mm. trees, yes. mm. and the, the color wasn't there, which is also part of the photography. You know, you sometimes uh, you can't always get what you want, but sometimes you get what you need. So we um, changed the schedule, and, and we were going to shoot sunset and then come down and then get up the next day and look for fall color. So I said, what if we don't get up early the next day? What if we just stay up there till 2 in the morning and shoot starlight and get these streaking clouds? And, we, and everybody was painting with their headlamps. And head, you know, it, was, it was one of those religious experiences. And one guy had a memory about Galen Rowell, and he, uh, my, my assistant, and he broke into tears and shared this with a circle of people. And it, was like, it was like a giant encounter group, but you talk about a connection. That's what it was. Wow. So it was a very high experience. Yeah. But slight shortage of oxygen possibly helped. <laughs> well, this, it, it is funny because one of the guys you know, saw this photograph of this tree up on a ridge and he ran after it. And then he realized that the, <laughs> it was his lungs awesome. were behind him. <laughs> You're gasping. Um, in terms of your post-processing, printing, all the, all the stuff that was handed out to other people. How much of that do you do yourself? Well, I've learned how to do it all. Yeah. And, and uh, for me, uh, going back to, to my dyslexia, I was always a very bad student. Um, I never, I, I think I never completed a test that I took. And what wasn't completed was counted against me. So consequently, my, my grades were, were pretty poor until I got to college. And then I found people that took sympathy with me and, uh, and, and I was do, able to do fairly well, but I don't learn by uh, reading books on Photoshop or Lightroom. And what I've decided is, uh, and I'm very, very fortunate, I have to go and say, I have one of the best printers in the country and uh, I invited him to my house to stay there for a week and we printed for a week. So I just, I basically mind melded with this yeah. and I sucked every bit of gray matter out. You get went away old Yeah, old. exactly. <laughs> so I learned how to print from him. And then John Shaw, who's written many yeah. books on Photoshop and Lightroom, is a really great friend and we teach workshops together. And uh, uh, I did the same thing with John. And, and, and again, my assistant from Mountain Light, Jerry Dodrell, is uh, doing some of the pre-press work for, for, you know, the who's who of photography. And uh, so I've, you know, it's, it's, it, to me, it's the hardest thing of digital is making that transition from essentially a visual medium to, yeah. to making decisions by the numbers. Yeah. Because you want those digits to be correct, you know, to at least have your starting point right. And I, and I think, I mean, I, I, I teach workshops with David Munch. Yeah. And, and, and David's having a hell of a time because you know, they keep talking about moving your histogram to the right, and he wants that blackness. Because <laughs> you know, you know, black is the exclamation mark, and it's what yeah. really does yeah. it.
but to understand that what you're looking at is only a JPEG rendering and that you're working with the raw file at first and then you, it's sort of like a negative and then you deal with the black point in Photoshop is hard for him to understand. And he, and he, I mean, I would have people in the workshops come up afterwards and say, David said, get him onto the, to the left of the histogram. And I, so I have to sort of, but, it, 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 but if you think about it, it's, it is sort of uh, cockeyed, you know, or I don't know how you'd say, but we'd say cattywampus. It's going the, you know, it, it's, it's, it's so intuitive to have it be a certain way mm. until you realize that it's like working with a negative. Well, so, so many people say that the camera is just basically wrong the way they display information. Yeah. They, yeah. they, don't, they don't do what they should do. They're doing, it for, like, they're doing it for engineers. Yeah, yeah. And if, if, if you can have a proper exposed to the right mode, right. you took a quick pre-picture, moved it, and then... Yeah. The, the, the transparency negative analogy, I think, is, is yeah. probably the, the best one yeah. that, that we have at the moment. Yeah. You know, that it, the raw file is a negative. It's, or you have or to it's your, it note, according. your basic raw notes for a project, yeah. you know. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. But understanding that, you know, as, as much as... I mean, to me, the big, the big concept is getting as much done before it becomes concretized into pixels. Yeah. When you're still dealing with numbers... On that side of the camera. Yeah. Exactly. And, and, and I think that's a huge leap for photographers because the, the more, uh, you know, I mean, David is totally, you know, floating out there in the ether and, and, and tuned into the composition and the art end of it. Mm. And, and he doesn't care about numbers at all. I mean, it's like, it's like what? Numbers, schmumbers, you know, it's like, and, and I'm that way, but I luckily have friends that have basically sat me down and beat me. A bit geeky one. Did you do anything with the the JPEG preview to make it work better for you? I know something. Yeah. The contrast up on the saturation. You know, I, I, there's a there's a that's a good question because uh, I've had people that are professionals that teach workshops telling me to uh, change. You know, so I'm shooting raw, raw, and they'll tell you, you know, to shoot daylight, shoot warm it up, you know, everything. I said, well, it doesn't matter. It's raw. And all you're going to do is make yourself feel good because the JPEG is going to be tweaked. People do not get this. I mean, they're, they're, I can name some who's who of so-called workshop leaders that are expounding on the fact that you need to warm it up. And it's, you know, you're, you're dealing with your JPEG. And, and, and maybe you want that to, to have, be a reference point, but... Uh, it's a preview, isn't it? It's a light yeah, box. Exactly. It, it exactly. sometimes gives people a bit of feedback. Of yeah. happy, happy feedback. It's, yeah. That's what it is about. Yeah. Well, what's, what's the other one? There's one that you can really kind of kick up the color and it's kind of like, Yeah, vivid, yeah. vivid or something, depending yes, on Yeah, that. yeah. And I, you know, it's sort of, mm. okay, well, it's, it's like taking drugs that makes you feel <laughs> good. <laughs> um, I did have a question. Do you want to have a. Yeah, of course. Well, I'll find this next question from the reader. It's, it, it, it's fascinating. Uh, hearing all your, all your anecdotes, and I, I'm, I'm sort of sorry to say this, really, but I, I keep thinking, I keep agreeing with everything, thinking that's how I do it. <laughs> Don't teach it. It's, uh, it, and it's actually also interesting from a, from having uh, kind of. I mean, I do still shoot five, four occasionally. And I still want to do my project with my 300 sheets of velvet I have left yeah. in the freezer. Right. Um, but, uh, and I've been working with um, Linhoff and uh, Phase One to have a slightly different digital workflow. Right. But I try to essentially keep the spirit the same in the way of working. And simply, I'm just, it feels like digital film. And that's what I'm trying to do. I understand about exposing to the right and optimizing the exposure, but the principles you know, of good composition and light and narrative and emotional connection are exactly the same. But some things don't change. You just have to figure out different ways of composing. I do a lot more composing with my arms and hands now, especially when I'm stitching. You know, so. because I'm using the Nikon, though, what I'm finding is that uh, I'm pushing the envelope a lot. And uh, with mm. the D3S, mm. you know, I'm shooting mm. ISO 4000. And I'm shooting, you know, yeah. shooting stars in the Milky Way and volcanoes and at night. And, and it's still clean. And it's very, very clean. Mm. And, uh, and then if you do some noise reduction in both the camera and in, in, in Lightroom, you're just, uh, I mean, you're, you're blown you're away. Mm. But I'm also shooting wildlife, I was going to say. It's, it's, uh, I, the thing I'm finding out with, uh, for, for me, that's very liberating is that over the years, I have this list of locations that's burned in my memory bank. And it's all these shots that I've looked way out there and thought, well, if I only had a really long piece of glass. <laughs> and now I'm going back, you know, with a, with a two to 400 zoom, which is quite sharp. 
and, a, and a, maybe a telextender on that. And uh, my God, I'm pulling out these uh, ridgeline compositions that I that I used to just sort of salivate. Yeah, yeah. And, and, yeah. I mean, I'm, you know, with a, with a five by four yeah. and a 720 <laughs> Nikkor, that was it. Two tripods, you know. And, oh, yeah, a and, nightmare to use too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and yeah. now I'm doing the equivalent of about a 1200 millimeter, mm. uh, and it's uh, it's stunning. Yeah. So that's kind of fun. Yeah. Well, there was a question from. Um, John Irving is saying, "What direction do you think photography is going? There's been so many changes. Now. Can you see anything happening in the next three, three to six years in terms of either technology or in terms of consumption?" You know, frankly, I'm, I'm more. Um, I mean, when when, when uh, Apple came out with the iPad. I mean, to me, that was the game changer because I think that's going to change the end, uh, the target that we're aiming for. And I, so I'm, for me personally, I'm going to go into publishing more. And I... And the digital publishing on iPads and such like. Targeted for that and then with the ability to do a, a hard copy coffee table on demand, but limited editions. Um, you know, I... I <laughs> At risk of being stupid again, <laughs> uh, I think that uh, photography for me uh, the game changer when it when 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 Nikon hit 24 megapixels, um, it probably occurred before that. But for me, that was the, that was the game changer. Up until that point, I was you know cheering film and saying you know you can't beat 1.5 gigs of uh, of information on a piece of film. And so you start saying never, and, and then now you say never, never say never. So I, I have no idea what the future uh, will bring, but although I, I think time-lapse movies are going to be much bigger. Uh, the idea with an iPad, um, there, the need for a still photograph on a, for a newspaper is, yeah, is gone. Mm. So why not have something that may be morphing before, you know, sort of Harry Potter-ish. Maybe sort of mm. you know, like, things like that, or, or, or video clips. As part uh, of recording uh, movement and yeah, things. sure. I mean, I, and I thought about time lapse. The, the problem is, is that uh, at some point there's just too many things in too many directions. One life. And if you're going to be really good at one of them, you better, um, you know. And, and that's the problem with digital: is it makes you into a generalist. Uh, and I just I just alluded to I'm shoot, I'm doing now doing black and white I'm doing low light I'm doing wildlife, you know I've got a pretty full plate, and to think about doing all these in time lapse as well, because uh, it's not just that simple you don't just transition you have to change the the bit depth, the color, all kinds of other factors let alone the computing horsepower and storage capacity. It's just like you're called on to do so many things nowadays that uh, you can, sure, you can do all of them, but to do them at, at, the, at the very highest level uh, requires, uh, I think, four or five more brains, yeah. at least for me. No, I, totally, I totally agree, and yeah. I, I, it does concern me because we are being asked to multitask in every area now. And also, by the way, is it photographers are asked to spend more time promoting their work than they are actually working exactly. you know, on, yeah, yeah. on their photography. You know, and those sorts of considerations, I think, are, are worrying. And I actually do believe that making still images is still a craft, and it requires a great deal of devotion and commitment to do that really, really well. And it is a problem with I'm being asked to do video clips and, and time lapse, you know, which are, are kind of separate skills. You know, if you if you look at filmmakers, you know, they always had a team around them, and somebody yes. did the sound, and so, exactly. so now these poor souls are having to do all of that themselves. Right. You know, they're not yet being asked to make still pictures, by the way. You know, let's hope they're not. Uh, but I do think it is—it's still a vital skill. And for me, I, I, you know, if if if, I, if it's the still picture first, and if I have time and I can figure it out, I might do something else. But it's still about distilling that moment, and I think that that's really important that we don't forget that. But yeah, the thing is—is is, is you were saying you, you you can do it all, but to do it all with the right technical parameters. It means that each, if you make the conversion from one step to the other, you have to go back and reset things. Yes. And mm -hmm. and um, like you know, a lot of people think that uh, that that the light is going to be there forever, and the situation is going to be there forever, mm -hmm. and it's totally ephemeral. Yes. 
And it, you know, like it or not, there is one decisive moment. And you better decide, you know, where you're going to be, what hat you're going to be wearing at that time. Mm. And, uh, and so you have to choose between, uh, you know, motion or stills or mm. panoramas or single image. Or, and, and, and black and white, I mean, do you, <clears> when, you, when you shoot black and white, Probably do some conversions from color to black and white. But you have well, you know, I, 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 I do that as, you know, as a teaching thing now in the class. Yeah. I, I've, went, I've gone back and I've, there are certain images that really sing in black and white. But I'm sort of stunned that if you compose well in one and, you, and you're good at light values, they, they do translate fairly easily. And, uh, but some people... Um, you know, it, and it's probably more true the people that are sort of more gimmicky, they don't translate so well. Yeah. So, um, do you think you have to, or what do you think it's beneficial to go out and take pictures thinking in black and white in the first place? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I think, I think in terms of light. Yeah. And uh, it works for me. So you know, the I just, sort of contrast work, they, they should work anyway, if the color is in, unless it's color specific. You know, I just, I really, I, I just can't be bothered with uh, differentiating. And, and, and color is, is, is you know, it, as Joe said, you know, that you go out with a certain uh, priority, and, and my priority is still going to be color. And, and I, you know, to me, that's really uh, the most important thing. But I'm sort of shocked, you know, like, like sometimes you get into situations like that Yosemite Falls shot, yeah, you know, yeah. with that. Yeah. Yeah, that goodness. gossamer yeah. fog layer. Yeah, that's amazing. In, in, mm. in color, it went extremely blue. I, and I always mm. wish that film could do a better job. It's, it's one of those places on the planet mm. that even if you filter it absolutely correctly with color, it's still going to go blue. I mean, it just it defies uh, color balance. And, and so when I turned it into a black and white, I was like, oh, what a concept, you know? <laughs> It was a really a pleasant surprise. So, last question from our readers, which is from David Langan, which is, which photographers inspire you now? Now? Yeah. Uh, well, maybe, maybe historically as well, but particularly now. Okay, well, I mean, this is actually fairly easy. I, mean, I, said, I mentioned Karsh at the onset. Uh, Ansel, of course. Of course, Philip Hyde, of course, Edward Weston. But during the Vietnam War, there was a Life magazine star, Larry Burroughs, whose work I thought was, mm. of all the war photographers, uh, you know, Gandhi's funeral. I mean, there's so many, he used to shoot for Life magazine, but so many of his covers and his work in general were uh, the reflection of a deep commitment to photojournalism. I thought he was just unbelievably good. Um, I, a friend of mine that just died recently, uh, Brian Lanker, went, also won a Pulitzer, uh, uh, great, great journalist photographer. I mean, he shot everything from Sports Illustrated swimsuit issues to... Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's <laughs> not a bad job. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he was a... I mean, I, I had a very... Uh, when I talked about the days in Chicago, there were photojournalists from different places in the U.S. that sort of gathered there to work at these four competing newspapers. And it really was the heyday. And, and many of these guys have gone on to be editors, you know, at the Geographic. I mean, at the Geographic, my editor at the Geographic was my intern. Right. You know, so, so um, there's certain, there seems to be a certain, um, you know, sort of synchronicity going on. But, uh, but, uh, but that, that's a pretty good start, you know. Any contemporary landscape photographers that you like? Oh, uh, there's a bunch. Yeah, there's, uh, I don't want to flatter them, though. <laughs> but Car Carr Clifton, yeah. I'd rate very highly. We just uh, want to feature on them. Yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah Car Carr's, uh, you know, one of the better ones. John Sexton, of course. I teach workshops with Bruce Barnbaum. Uh, he's uh, another black and white guy. Uh, for, you know, when you're at my stage of life, uh, it, it, to me it's very important to kind of stay fresh and I, and I there's, a, there's a tendency to, you know, to, to I, I call these people that are environmentalists earth gerbils. <laughs> and they all, you know, they're all very committed to, to the environment and um, 
but I also teach workshops with fine art black and white people. And uh, Jay Dussard was a Guggenheim fellow and did the American West cowboy portraits. And, and we just have a wonderful time. And it's, uh, it's just really good to sort of, you know, not, stick your, not stigmatize yourself for one thing. Uh, it sort of keeps me loose to be with these guys. And, uh, but, but back to the, your original question, I mean, uh, to me there's almost too many to count. Uh, yeah. is, that, is that a problem, the proliferation of the amount of people that are doing landscape photography? I, remember, I saw a recent photograph of Tunnel View with, that must have been 100 people yeah, yeah, sure. uh, yeah. stacked up there. Right. Exactly. Well, that's the problem, is that we've got all these visual cliches that were actually important images at a certain time. Well, Mono Lake, you know, and, and Antelope Canyon. I mean, Bruce Barnbaum used to go there and camp there for months yes. at a time and never see anybody. So, um, uh, you know, I think it's very, it's much easier to be technically good. Uh, you know, Daniel Beltra is, is, is a, uh, I told him about three or four years ago, you're going to be a rock star. Because he, he got the, uh, the Prince of Wales thing to do the, on the rainforest, and he did a hell of a job. I mean, he came mostly from an airplane. I consider him a landscape photographer. And uh, yeah, his work is, you know, I think, unbelievable. These oil spill pictures were just uh, subliminal. Uh, have you seen that show at all? Is it's, uh, yeah, well, I haven't seen the show, but... Uh, hmm. yeah, you, you were yeah. a judge, or...? I, I can't say too much about that at the moment. <laughs> well, I already know. But, uh, but, uh, yeah, but I mean, he, uh, he had a show at the Seattle Aquarium that was just stunning. Yeah. And, and I, you know, because I worked on two raves, and I've got to see the stuff in the raw coming through and have a hand and, you know, voicing an opinion here and there. But to me, uh, when you're saying contemporaries, to me, that's the exciting thing. And when I, when I look at somebody in their 40s now, I think of them as kids. And, and I, it's just gratifying to know that they're coming up. Yes. Um, I, I can be pretty pessimistic about the future of the planet and, uh, and, and wild ground in general. But, uh, you, know, it does, it, you know, you just have to sort of lean towards the good and, and hope you can make a difference.